Anthony Summers. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon. And I, I'm sure that you were gilding the lily there. I'm not. <laughs> and, and I'm not even sure that I'd want to have that responsibility of being <laughs> responsible for you being here for several days. Um, as the, I, I'm going to be, uh, you know, I thought it before lunch um, that John Newman any minute was going to produce uh, a large box and put a man or a woman inside it and then cut it in half with a circular saw yes. <laughs> and, and then and, and prove that it was in two parts and then put it together again and hey presto the woman or the man would jump out of the box and it, would, it was just magical stuff and I'm not going to do anything like that. Um, I, my take on, on this case is the take of possibly of a lazy person, certainly of a reporter and we certainly know that there are a lot of reporters um, who are very, very lazy. Um, as the cliche has it, I know where I was that day. Um, for a fellow who's made his living ever since as, as a journalist uh, and author, my memory for me has a special relevance. When the news from Dallas broke, I was at university in England, working in a pub to pay my way. It was early evening, UK time, uh, and news of the assassination came through to the bar where I was pulling pints uh, on the radio. And within minutes, and that was very fast in those days, the phone rang beside me on the bar and it was the boss of a major TV program that I'd worked for in the summer vacation, moonlighting, because I had reporting ambitions very early on. Um, and he said, can you get to Heathrow Airport to fly to Dallas tonight? I'm chartering a plane and sending a team. How soon can you get there? Well, can you imagine? I was not yet 21 years old. The offer of such an assignment was an extraordinary honor for me. I said, yes, sir. I made my excuses to the, the man who ran the pub. Uh, and I ran for a, a toothbrush and a taxi. And I was just getting in the taxi when the phone rang again. And this time it was the great man's secretary um, saying, sorry, but we, I was asked to tell you that we found someone with more experience. Oh. <laughs> and I went back to pulling pints. And, and for me, that for a long time was, was the end of covering the Kennedy assassination for, for nearly 20 years. I saw Mark Lane on television and was deeply underwhelmed. Um, I followed the Jim Garrison circus fairly closely as a news story, and I concluded then that it was, it was a circus, um, and I still feel it was a circus. I, years and years later, I met Jim Garrison, and that's another story, but he asked to meet me, and it was all so secretive. This is long after the New Orleans affair, uh, and he asked to meet me in a sauna bath. I, I mean, it was all very strange. But 20 years, nearly 20 years later, the call came again from a television producer again. The House Assassinations Committee, he said, had been mulling coming to a conspiracy finding. Would I make a documentary for the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, and for a US company which was paying for it? And I did make an hour-long program, and of course the boon that I had at that time was that many of the, of, of the important witnesses were still alive, whereas, of course, now many, many have gone. So I had that huge advantage. The documentary was called What Do We Know Now That We, we Didn't Know Then? And all these years later, it seems to me still very relevant to ask ourselves that question. One of the reasons I don't say uh, that I know what happened in Dallas but express what I hope are rational suspicions, is the reason that I wrote the book in the first place. As I plunged into the black hole that is assassinology, I thought many of the puzzles had probably been tackled by an earlier generation of reporters in the, back in the 60s. After all, wasn't I in a fine pr profession? 
Then I got angry, very angry. I discovered that they hadn't done the work. With a few honorable exceptions, there'd be no serious attempt at investigative reporting. And I happen to think that most reporting should be, I mean, I, I hate the word investigative reporting. That's what we should do for a living. Um, in the land of the free, certainly there'd been very little investigation. Uh, and if you're kind enough to read the latest edition of my book on, on, on uh, the case, take a look at how rarely in 100 pages of sourcing notes at the end, I quote from major media sources. I quote them hardly at all because few reporters did any real work. The media were shamefully delinquent. And that's really the reason that I stuck at this after I'd made the documentary and wrote my, my book in its first form. In those days before Vietnam and Watergate and the era of real chronic skepticism about those in power, investigation was left to government. As former committee chief counsel Blakey said a long time ago, it was, in his quote, shattering to discover how poor the apparently thorough official probe of the president's murder really was. I noticed a couple of days ago in the Washington Post that a former Warren staffer, now in his 80s, Charles Schaefer Jr., was quoted last week as saying, maybe we missed something. Uh, he said he, he uh, suspected organized crime figures were perhaps involved. Uh, I don't think I'm wrong. He didn't mention the intelligence agencies in, in, in any context at all. Um, the Warren Commission, of course, uh, with all respect to Schaefer and, and his, his um, comment about the mob, which was not irrelevant, um, had it that Jack Ruby, who killed Oswald, silencing him forever, had no significant link to the mafia. The House Committee would show conclusively that, to the contrary, Ruby, had, in fact, had links to organized crime from his youth until just before the assassination. The committee would also find, and people usually forget this, find links between Oswald's family and organized crime. The committee suspected the mob, but could pin nothing on the mafia leaders of the day. And although you have to look harder for that in the committee's work than you did for the suspicions about organized crime, they also cast suspicion on the murkier parts of the anti-Castro movement. But still, again, nothing that they didn't stick it to the, the CIA or the intelligence agencies. When the Justice Department failed to follow through as the committee had recommended, few noticed, even though the committee's former chief counsel, Blakey, had said quite seriously that he believed back then, and I haven't heard this mentioned for a long time, he believed back then, around 1980, that a tough, renewed investigation could have brought conspirators to trial. To think now, though, that any one official is going to do anything about this case, some of you may disagree, may seem to be whistling Dixie. On marking the 50th anniversary last year, however, there was a piece in The New Yorker by John Cassidy. He pointed out that there is, quote, a substantial reason why the doubters survived. The official version of events begs questions. In some aspects, it beggars belief. Questioning the official version of history is a sign of democratic vigor. Yes, it is. And, and so we should feel better about being gathered here this weekend. I took the title my book now carries, Not in Your Lifetime, from the answer that Chief Justice Warren gave in 1964 when asked if all the investigation's information would be made public. He said, some of you know this, yes, there will come a time, but it might not be in your lifetime. I'm not referring to anything especially, but there may be some things that involve security. This would be preserved, but not made public. He said he was thinking of stays by the, assa the alleged assassin in the Soviet Union and Mexico, and there may indeed have been national security ramifications at that time. Since then, of course, and against the wishes of some federal agencies, as we've heard again this afternoon, and not least thanks to Jim Nazar, millions of pages of documents have been released. 
Not that 50 years on we have anything like all. Some army intelligence and secret service records have been destroyed. There are questions too as to the whereabouts of some naval intelligence material. The CIA is, and I think this remains correct, withholding at least 1,171, and, and Jim would, would calculate it as more, documents as, quote, national security classified, still, today. If one single thing keeps those seriously focused on researching the case going, it's the challenge those continued withholdings pose, and keeps me in Darkest Ireland also still somewhat interested. What we really have cause to think we know is that after all this time and the efforts of so many people, so much remains unknown. But you don't have to be what they like to dub a conspiracy theorist to harbor multiple questions about the evidence the Warren Commission handed down as certainties. Millions know, excuse me, largely thanks to people like you, how badly the autopsy, and I'm going to mention a few things that are ground zero on the case, but they're worth reminding ourselves about on a day in which, you know, with all respect to John Newman, who's a friend of mine, and I've used some of his work in, in one of my books, but I mean, this was really complex stuff, I think you'll agree, that John was going through today. I think it's worth going back to a few of the, the baselines. The autopsy and ballistic evidence was handled so poorly in our Western societies, I think one would hope that a homeless person's autopsy would be handled better than John Kennedy's, even in Ireland. There are people who still give t a lot of time and debate to the studying the wounds, the trajectories, and the bullet fragments, and some of them will be talking here, and I, I respect the work they do, but I've long since distanced myself from all that. I guess because to accept the physical, to, to, we, we ought to accept now that the physical evidence area is what the lawyers call a non liquet something that will never be resolved for certain. Better, at least for me, to look elsewhere. Easier, anyway. Fingerprint evidence can, of course, be crucial, and Oswald's prints, I remind you again, were found on book cartons near the window from which he allegedly fired from the Texas School Book Depository. But that proved nothing. As an, as an employee, the alleged assassin had been legitimately working in that very area. What though, remember this, of the palm print found on one of the boxes that was never identified? Whose was that? We don't know, not least because in a ludicrous oversight, not all those who worked in the building were fingerprinted. Why not? Because after Oswald was arrested, the building superintendent asked that the fingerprinting process be halted. And incredibly, law enforcement officials obliged. So we don't know whose palm print that was. Could have been innocent, could have been quite not the opposite of innocent. There is, as you know, much more. The possibility, for example, that Oswald wasn't on the infamous sixth floor at the time the shots were fired. He claimed he'd been in a downstairs lunchroom at the time and there were witnesses who supported his story or appeared to support his story. I think it was myself who interviewed in detail for the first time Caroline Arnold, the secretary to a senior executive in the building. She told me she saw Oswald in the lunchroom at 12.15 p.m. or perhaps as late as 12.25 p.m. I found her credible and I've had no cause to change my mind. Had the motorcade been on time, in fact it ran five minutes late and went by at 12.30, the president would have passed the building at 1225. Would a would-be assassin who planned to kill the president have been sitting around downstairs as late as 1215 or anything like that? Bedrock stuff, I think it's still important. Yet it proved nothing. As an employee, the alleged assassin had been legitimately, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Paragraph. There's something else that's toweringly important. The cliche is that murderers usually have motive, means, and opportunity. Oswald had the opportunity, and he had the means, a rifle. But motive? 
the Commission never fa figured out a satisfactory motive for Oswald. The overall testimony was that he rather liked the President, and there's not a jot of even half-reliable evidence that he loathed him, let alone wished to do him harm. A geologist, Volkmar Schmidt, who talked of Oswald's anger towards Kennedy over Cuba in a TV interview three decades later, had right after the assassination told the FBI that Oswald had said nothing to him about the president. Schmidt's later interview had zero credibility. Oswald's behavior on November the 22nd sure leaves it highly likely, certain I would say, and there'd be people who disagree, that he was no innocent. He was clearly somehow involved in what later, in what occurred that day, but how? Could it be that as Oswald himself claimed, he was a patsy set up to take the blame? Any serious look at the case involves disentangling the threads that run through Oswald's activity in the months and years before the assassination. The clandestine operations of US intelligence, the Cuba factor, and organized crime, the US mafia. I can only sketch in the outlines of the intelligence angle. Others have done that in, in far more depth and certainly more closely than I, than I could sometimes follow. Consider, though, Oswald's three-year defection to the Soviet Union and his return the year before the assassination. This was a former US Marine who'd had access at the height of the Cold War to some information on the operations of the U-2 spy plane. On defecting, he'd said openly that he'd undertaken to give the Soviets what he knew. He was a self-declared would-be traitor. Would you not think that on returning to the United States, Oswald would have been, at a minimum, severely interrogated. The official line, however, has been that Oswald was allowed to return home and melt back into life as a law-abiding citizen. It doesn't wash, and snippets of evidence indicate otherwise. There's that CIA document, long withheld in its full version, that shows that, Os that officials discussed, quote, the laying on of interviews on his return. A senior member of the Soviet Russia division wrote that his department had an OI, that's operational intelligence, in Oswald. Someone on the CIA's counterintelligence staff had placed Oswald's name on what was called the CIA project watch list as early as the time of his defection to the USSR. And as Jefferson Morley noted, the interest continued until a few weeks before the assassination. I tried in my book to speculate very little, but were this left-wing defector come traitor think somewhat a sort of junior league Edward Snowden interrogated on his return, might he have been given options? Like, you're a traitor subject to a lengthy stay in jail, or perhaps you're a traitor and you could go to jail, or you could perhaps be useful to us. Maintain your left-wing stance, and we may get you to do things for us. Back to the facts. Oswald did return to civilian life, did go to, back to his focus on socialist activity, and especially on communist Cuba. Remember the date he came back. It was shortly before the Cuban Missile Crisis, the armed standoff and the propaganda war between the US and the Soviet Union and Castro's Cuba was at its most tense and dangerous. Oswald joined, we all know, the pro-Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee, went to New Orleans, the city of his birth, and ostensibly went about setting up that local branch of Fair Play for Cuba. I say ostensibly because the indications are that it was a charade. He reported a clash in the street with some anti-Castro Cuban exiles a week before it occurred. Stuff like that just isn't going to go away. When the clash did occur, and Oswald was arrested for disturbing the peace, two police officers got the impression there was some sort of a setup that Oswald was, quote, being used. Used? Used by whom? The files show that the Fair Play for Cuba Committee was being targeted, bugged, and infiltrated by the FBI. The group with which Oswald clashed, and people have talked about this today, the Directorio Revolucionario Help me, Bessiano. Uh, 
revolucionario, can't do it, estudantil, or DRE, was being manipulated by the CIA as part of the secret war against Cuba, a war that involved both armed raids on Cuba by exiled fighters and complex propaganda operations. The DR, DRE leaders in New Orleans reported back to a CIA case officer. I had an interview, and I haven't seen this reported anywhere else, uh, with a former paid tool of the FBI, Joseph Burton. The Bureau described him as a valuable and reliable source, whose job back then was to pose as a Marxist and to infiltrate radical groups. Burton told me that Oswald had been, quote, connected with the FBI, that FBI agents had spoken of owning Oswald. The FBI and the CIA, who offer historically at loggerheads with each other, were cooperating to an unusual extent at that time. In September 1963, a CIA officer and a senior FBI official met to discuss new plans for action against the pro-Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee. The CIA, quote, advised that it was giving some consideration to countering the activities of the committee in foreign countries and giving thought to planting deceptive information which might embarrass the committee. The day after that memo was signed, Oswald applied for a tourist card for a visit to Mexico. A new passport was issued to him within 24 hours, even though his application stated he might wish to return to the Soviet Union. You might think, given Oswald's background as a defector, that's a little surprising. Oswald did go, of course, to Mexico City, and his six-day visit um, remains, thank you, mm -hmm. remains, of course, one of the most mysterious, telltale, perhaps telltale, episodes of the entire story. It makes for a fresh chapter in the new edition of my book, although here we have to zip past it in a couple of minutes. And you all know that his ostensible purpose in Mexico was to go to the Cuban and Soviet embassies, armed with his credentials as a pro-Castro activist, to try to get a visa to go to Cuba. He failed. The Cubans, I went to Mexico and to Cuba and talked to relevant witnesses, have said that they thought that he might well be a CIA agent provocateur. It seems at least possible, I would say more than possible, especially fed a couple of drinks, that the CIA, that the CIA did indeed hope to use Oswald, wittingly or unwittingly, as a cog in the covert anti-Castro operations. I say perhaps unwittingly, for there are indications that an agency imposter used Oswald's identity in Mexico City. The House Assassinations Committee took this possibility seriously, and we've heard from Eddie Lopez and Dan Harboy on this today, and separate inter information, nothing to do with Oswald, establishes that the use of imposters by the CIA was a common ploy at the time. Jeremy Gunn, who was the executive director of the Assassination Records Review Board, said a standard operation was to impersonate Americans in telephone contact with the Soviet embassy. More important, and this is more stuff that just won't go away, is the tangle of information that arose from the CIA's photographic and audio surveillance of the communist embassies. They were both, of course, and we heard from Eddie on this, covered by cameras monitoring comings and goings, CIA microphones inside the Cuban embassy. They still keep them in Havana and they, they showed them to me, or they showed me what they said were the microphones that the CIA had planted. It's the BBC and me coming out. Um, and, and telephone calls were all bugged. This is, all, this is so established as so, we know it. Two of the calls that Oswald supposedly made to the Soviet embassy appear not to have been made by the real Oswald. Could one not establish whether that is so by comparing the voice on the tape with the known voice of the authentic Oswald? Good specimen was available. Recent broadcast he was done in connection with his pro-Castro activity in Louisiana. Well, no, said the CIA. It claimed the Mexico surveillance tapes had been routinely wiped weeks before the assassination because it claimed although we now know that it was not so at all, Oswald had supposedly been of no interest. Except we also know from the draft memoir left behind by somebody who I don't think has been mentioned today, 
the, the then CIA station chief in Mexico City, Winston Scott, that in his words, Oswald, quote, had been a person of great interest, an emphasis on the word great, to us during his visit. We kept a special watch on him. Except, too, that we can now be virtually certain that the tapes were not routinely wiped before the assassination. Senior Warren Commission counsel William Coleman and his fellow commission attorney David Slauson and in his retirement the CIA station chief's deputy all told me in the 1990s that they listened to a tape recording of Oswald apparently while in Mexico in April 1964, months after the assassination. There's recently been internet discussion of this, which I reported a long time ago, with the suggestion that all those men, Coleman, Slauson, and Chief of Station, uh, the Deputy Chief of Station, may have, quote, remembered something that never happened. I vigorously counter that. I interviewed all three men within an hour or so on the same afternoon, UK time. It was as clear as it could be that Slauson and Coleman admitted to having listened to the tape only once they knew from me, because they asked me what the deputy station chief had said, that he'd acknowledged it. Very rapidly afterwards, I flew to the States, to DC, and um, to, to um, California, to quiz all three of them again. And it was clear that each of them had been concerned that they were breaching security in telling me about having listened to the tape as late as April 1964. It's been suggested recently uh, by Shannon in, 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 um, in conversations uh, relating to his book on the case last year um, that of the three, Coleman may have been becoming senile and misremembered. I can only say that I talked with Coleman at length in his office, took lunch at his house, swam with him as in a swimming pool, busily swimming around the swimming pool, talking about Mexico City. And it's my view that this was a man who still had all his marbles. Those three guys um, were absolutely consistent in what they said, and it was clear that, that the two Warren Commission guys, until they heard that the CIA, the CIA deputization chief had acknowledged listening to the tapes, they were very worried about admitting it. They were worried about, in Coleman's terms, what I signed back then. What became of the recording of the, that they listened to, and indeed the photographs that were, so, were surely snapped of Oswald by the surveillance cameras on one, surely, of a total of five visits to the communist embassies? The CIA has offered no satisfactory answer. But we know that when Station Chief Scott died some years afterwards, counterintelligence chief James Angleton flew down to Mexico within hours, searched through the dead man's belongings, searched Scott's, uh, seized Scott's draft memoir and what's been described as a stack of reel-to-reel -reel tapes labeled Oswald and ordered that they be flown to headquarters in Washington. Though some of the memoir has been released to the uh, station chiefs next of kin, it seems that the other material was disposed of under a CIA destruction order. It goes on and on. And I want to get to something that is brand new, new as of last year um, in work that I did for my book. Um, there's the, what Sylvia Ma called years ago, the Rosetta Stone of the case, the testimony of the Odeo sisters, which strongly suggests to this day that there was an attempt to set Oswald up. It posed a problem for the Warren Commission, one that never was resolved, never has been resolved. Commission attorneys took the view that the Odeo sisters were excellent, credible witnesses, that their accounts seemed truthful. I got what I believe were the first independent interviews with Sylvia and Annie Odeo, and I share that view. They were, they were entirely credible women. We, so it looks as though someone, anyway, whoever it was, was attempting to set Oswald up just weeks before the assassination. There's more, and it goes back to what I said about the beginning, about the notion that organized crime had something to do with the assassination. 
Um, in the attempts to dis establish who the two Hispanics who'd accompanied Oswald to see the Odeo sisters were, investigators took statements from a man who initially led them down a false trail, offering what Congress's committee called a fabrication. This was Lauren Hall, alias Pasillo. He'd served in the US Army, reportedly trained in counterintelligence, was indeed involved with the anti-Castro campaign in the New Orleans area, and he'd worked for mafia boss Santo Traficante, one of the two mafia bosses who's been linked repeatedly to the assassination. Which brings us to the issue of motive, and if Oswald didn't kill the president, or at any rate didn't do it on his own, who did? Who might have had the motive to kill Kennedy? Though Oswald had lived for a long time in Russia, and for a couple of years in Russia, and though available information makes it clear that Soviet intelligence took a real interest in him, no serious observer still suggests, or ever really suggested, that the Soviets wanted the president's death or had anything to do with the assassination. The theory that Castro's Cuba was behind the tragedy has had serious attention over the years, not least last year, in the context of the possibility that Castro learned of CIA efforts to kill him and struck first. The supporting evidence for such a theory, however, is very flimsy. Militating against it is the fact that had Washington discovered that Cuba had a hand in the assassination, US retaliation would, could have been expected to be devastating, to have swept the revolution away once and for all. And Castro and his people knew that. Of the plausible suspects, that leaves for me the anti-Castro exiles, mafia bosses, and I don't reject the possibility, although I don't lean towards it nearly as strongly as some people who've talked today, elements within the CIA. There's no inherent conflict in lumping those three together. All three were committed to the fight against Castro. The mafia, because the revolution had robbed them of their gambling gold mine, the anti-Castro people and their CIA backers for obvious reasons. Many anti-Castro fighters loathed Kennedy with a passion because they thought he had betrayed their cause at the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961 by the way he'd resolved the missile crisis and by his subsequent clampdown on their activity. Mafia bosses, notably Traficante and New Orleans' Carlos Marcelo, hated the president and had even threatened, allegedly, to kill him because the Kennedy administration was conducting its onslaught on organized crime. If the anti-Castro groups and the mob bosses did plot to kill Kennedy, seeing to it that the crime was blamed on a pro-Castro activist would have seemed like a masterstroke. After all this, and we've only scratched the surface, the end game, have there been any plausible admissions on the 50th anniversary last year, there was discussion of, of admissions that mafia bosses Traficante and Carlos Marcelo supposedly made in old age. I've looked hard at those stories, and the alleged confession tales are, in my view, very unreliable. Um, when he talked about suspecting that the mob might have had a hand in the assassination in the post last, last uh, couple of days ago, Charles Schaefer was cited as saying he was troubled by the late mob lawyer Frank Regano's claim that Traficante admitted to him just before he died that he and Marcelo were behind the assassination. I looked into that. I mean, this is simple stuff maybe, but it is what I do. I looked into that thoroughly. I interviewed Regano, and I didn't believe him. There's not only no evidence that Traficante was where and when he supposedly was when Regano said that Traficante confessed, but I found information indicating that the mob boss was actually elsewhere. Regano himself struck me as an unreliable witness trying to make headlines with his book and make a buck. I talked to him half a day. I set much more store by other apparent admissions, some of them gleaned from my own interviewing. Traficante associate John Martino should be high on any suspect list. His connection with the mafia boss aside, 
He'd worked in a casino in Cuba before the revolution, done time in a Castro jail, worked on both the military and the propaganda operation to topple Castro, and was amongst those who spun stories about Oswald after the assassination. His wife Florence told me that her husband spoke of an imminent assassination attempt on the morning of November the 22nd. And this is the kind of testimony from an interviewee that I warm to, that her husband had talked about an assassination attempt going down on the morning of November the 22nd, hours before it took place. According to her and the couple's son, Edward, the news from Dallas when it came seemed more like confirmation. Later, when he was dying of heart disease, Martino told an associate, whom I also interviewed, that he'd been part of the assassination. Martino said, the anti-Castro people put Oswald together. Oswald didn't know who he was working for. Oswald made a mistake. They had Ruby kill him. Martino referred, too, to a second gunman who'd been involved, a Cuban who had been the other trigger. On the matter of a second gunman, there may be progress at last. In 2007, in the company of former Chief Counsel Professor Blakey, I visited Florida to speak with Reynaldo Martinez, a Cuban no one had heard of before. Martinez was in his 80s, and he'd made contact with Blakey, saying there was something he wanted to get off his chest before he died. While in a Castro prison in the mid-1960s on a minor charge involving illegal currency offenses, Martinez said he'd learned that an anti-Castro fighter he'd known well since their student days had spoken of his participación, participation in the assassination of the president. The fighter's name was Herminio Diaz. He'd worked in one of Mafia Boss, tra Boss Traficante's casinos, is listed in CIA files. He was a crack marksman, a known assassin, and he was in the United States in 1963. After Blakey and I had talked with Martinez for the best part of a day, I interviewed him on camera. Here now is a clip of that interview, I hope, with some a commentary A Cuban exile by living in Miami, Reynaldo Martinez, contacted the former chief counsel of the House Assassinations Committee to say he had information that he wanted to get off his chest before he died. Martinez wanted to talk about a man who was once his closest friend, Herminio Diaz, who had been a committed anti-Castro fighter and, before the revolution, worked in a mafia-run casino in Havana. Diaz, Martinez came to believe, took part in the Kennedy assassination. My best friend was Herminio Diaz Garcia. Herminio was a very reserved person, very introverted, very serious, and spoke very little, but he was exceptionally courageous. Herminio, I don't think he finished at the institute in Havana. He loved shooting. He was passionate about it, whether with a rifle or a pistol. It was his obsession. He always had a weapon on him. As corroborating information confirms, Diaz became an assassin. The first violent act he committed was the murder of Cucu Hernández Vega in the Cuban embassy in Mexico. After that, he got involved in trying to kill Figueres, the president of Costa Rica. He got involved too in anti-Batista activities, including an attempt on Batista's life. By 1959, Diaz was working as a security guard in a Havana casino run by Mafia boss Santo Traficante. Come the revolution, when Castro placed Traficante under arrest, it was Diaz who fixed his release. He asked me a favor to bring him to Tresconia to see a man named Santo Traficante, who had promised him that if he got out, he would make Herminio head of security at the Riviera. Herminio asked them to release Santo Traficante. It wasn't a problem, just a matter of fixing things. 
Traficante was released four days later. Soon after, Diaz also left Cuba. Martinez, who wound up in a Castro prison, never saw his friend alive again. In 1966, news broke that Diaz and a fellow anti-Castro fighter carrying American ID had been killed in a raid on the Cuban coast. The raider's leader, Antonio Cuesta, was terribly wounded. In prison, still traumatized, he talked with Martinez. I spoke a lot with Tony Cuesta because, of course, I was sorry about the situation he was in. He knew of my friendship with Herminio. He told me there had been a moment when Herminio had told him, Tony Cuesta, that Herminio had participated in the murder of the President of the United States. That was the conversation that day. That's all he said? Yes, that's what he said. Didn't you press him for details? No. It was as if he hadn't told me. I accepted it because he told me, and I believe that in that moment he wasn't lying to me. But I didn't pressure him to tell me more. Was Herminio professionally capable of doing that? Ooh, really? Oh yes, Herminio was a professional in that, in the use of weapons. Did you believe it at the time? I neither believed it, nor did I disbelieve it, because I had no evidence to know if it was the truth. I think he told me the truth. What Martinez told us was of course hearsay, and more complex than can be explained in a brief soundbite. He insisted, though, that it was la verdad, mi verdad, the truth, my truth. Is this significant information on the fate that befell President Kennedy in Dallas? Martinez's friend Diaz had an appropriate profile. He was a crack marksman, had a known track record as a political assassin, and was involved with the Mafia and the more extreme anti-Castro groups, both of which were bitterly hostile to the president. When the shots rang out in Dealey Plaza in November 1963, was Diaz there, behind a gun? Forgive the bit of theater at the end with the, the rolls on the drums. I believed, I, I found that witness credible as he talked to me and counsel, Chief Counsel Blakey. Um, I found him credible and uh, Blakey told me he thought it, uh, for, for quotation, that he thought it potentially a breakthrough of historic importance. In the fog of knowns and unknowns of the case are elements that could perhaps tell us whether and how Oswald, the pro-Castro Marxist, may have been set up to take the blame. In New Orleans, there was the DRE, the anti-Castro group that appeared to clash with a, appeared to clash with a pro-Castro Oswald. That group was funded and supervised by the CIA, a fact the CIA failed to reveal to the Warren Commission. In Mexico City was senior CIA officer David Phillips, whom we've heard about ad nauseam today and probably will continue to hear about. He'd previously been the CIA's man in Havana, running anti-Castro propaganda with oversight over operations in New Orleans and in charge of the surveillance operations against the Cuban and Soviet embassies at the time Oswald visited. Phillips may have been one and the same as Maurice Bishop, an intelligence officer who, after the assassination, allegedly sought to fabricate information linking Oswald to the Castro Cubans. The source for that claim is Antonio Vassiana, founder of the militant anti-Castro group Alpha 66. Now in his 80s, He's here today and will shortly speak with us himself. It will be an unprecedented public appearance that those of us who know him greatly appreciate. I long since interviewed Antonio at length and multiply and found him, too, a credible source. I interviewed him many times, repeatedly. So 
First, before me, had the late Gaydon Fonzi, a House Committee investigator whom I came to know well and greatly admired for his devotion to his work and above all, for his integrity. Gaydon's widow, Marie, is also here and I know that she too is extremely welcome. There's a special reason that I personally came to believe Vesiana and his account of an intelligence officer who used the name Bishop, who he said he'd seen with Oswald before the assassination and who later asked him to fabricate information linking Oswald to Castro's people. Vesiana, when I talked to him, had told me repeatedly that as an exile activist, he always, in touch with the CIA, he always contacted Bishop through a cutout let me correct myself. I, I, I said in touch with the CIA. What Vesiana always told us was that he was in touch with a person who was in US intelligence. He didn't say at, at that time, he certainly did not say CIA. But he said he always contacted Bishop through a cutout. He told investigator Fonzi that too, but he always resisted revealing who the cutout was. And, what I'm about to say is the reason that I came really to believe Vesiana. I pestered him again and again about the cutout and eventually decided to take a risk to push Antonio's patience to the limit and tell him that I thought he'd made it all up. He seemed startled and then frustrated that he neither hit me nor threw me out of his house. Instead, he took me upstairs, opened a hatchway to the loft, and dug in among the spider's webs and things in lofts. Doug found an old cardboard box until he found a business card bearing the name of a woman in Puerto Rico. She, he said, had been the cutout. I flew to Puerto Rico and located the woman. Everything she told me, and I interviewed her completely by surprise on her lunch break without having announced myself at all fitted what Vesiana had told me. What she said took me to a further link in the chain, a right-wing journalist in Washington, D.C. named Virginia Pruitt. Asked about Vesiana, she replied at first, where is he now? A little later, though, she said she'd never met him. <laughs> but she said, you have to move around people like that. She claimed that she didn't personally know a bishop and had never met David Phillips. Phillips, to the contrary, was to say that he knew Pruitt well. Clearly some mistake, as they would say in our magazine, Private Eye. There's new information on the Phillips bishop issue, new information last year. While I was preparing the new edition of my book, former CIA clandestine services uh, officer Glenn Carl recalled asking Phillips whether he'd been bishop. Philip's reaction, Carl said, was to acknowledge that he was the man in question, but he did not explicitly confirm to me that he'd done what he was accused of doing, meeting with Oswald. He avoided discussing this point. Antonio Vassiana will today let us know, once and for all, I think, what he knows to be the truth, or believes is the truth, about the man he knew as his intelligence contact, Bishop, who may or may not, let's leave it to, to Antonio, have been senior CIA officer David Phillips. After all the work and all the years, I don't pretend to know the answer. What is clear though, is that elements of the truth have been kept secret, are being kept secret still, not least by the CIA. It, emer uh, it, excuse me, it emerged a while back that Joannides, the officer brought in from retirement to liaise with Congress's Assassinations Committee to decide what CIA documents investigators could and could not see was none other, though the agency concealed this from the committee, than the very CIA officer who in 1963 had been case officer to the DRE, the anti-Castro group that had the purported clash with Oswald in New Orleans. It was a gross deception, one that Robert Blakey has called criminal a willful obstruction of justice. I no longer believe anything the agency told us. Professor Anna Nelson, who served on the Records Review Board, suggested that there be a congressional probe of the CIA's alleged corruption of an inquiry into the Kennedy assassination. But I don't think 
we should hold our breath. It's very late now, contrary to what some people here think, probably too late to be able to take the case much further. I leave the last word, ironically, to another former Warren Commission counsel, Bert Griffin, who I was told was here today, although I hadn't seen him and shaken his hand yet. Bert Griffin told me when I was making a, a program for the BBC that he felt, quote, betrayed because the CIA and the FBI deliberately misled us. Concerning, consider the possible reality that under the American system of civil liberties and the requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, it is virtually impossible to prosecute or uncover a well-conceived and well-executed conspiracy. Thank you for listening.